So the Dungeons and Dragons YouTube channel has been putting out a fair amount of videos on the changes to the new classes. And since, you know, Warlock has just unequivocally won every single poll I've put out for favorite classes, we're going to go ahead and start with the new Warlock for the 2024 Player's Handbook, and then we're going to go ahead and dissect this video a little bit. Let's jump into it. Warlocks are really great. We are talking about them today, and there's a lot of new things in the new Player's Handbook. The Warlock was, like all of the classes, a fun journey for us as we returned to it and looked at what could we do to take this class that so many people love playing uh, with its very unique spellcasting system, its otherworldly patrons, its eldritch invocations. How could we preserve what's great about the class while also bringing improvements? One of the new things that Warlock players will see right away at level two is a new feature called Magical Cunning. And Magical Cunning is a way for Warlocks to get some of their packed magic back sooner than just on short rests and long rests. All right, so this is really important, and it's fantastic to see the Warlocks get something like this because they're... Spell slots are already super limited, so their variability is already limited. So for them to be able to get their pack magic back faster is great, in my opinion. So already we're coming out the gate strong for the Warlocks. This is looking up. They've needed a buff for a while, in my opinion. Uh, and I know a fair amount of people have shared that opinion based off comments on some of my videos. So this is looking good so far. Uh, we knew that Warlocks often feel overly constrained when it comes to their spell casting, and so Magical Cunning is a way to relieve some of the pressure there. Now, with Magical Cunning at level 2, something that used to be at level 2 then moved to level 1, and that's Eldritch Invocations. Eldritch Invocations, you start getting right away as a Warlock. And over the course of your career, you're also going to get more of them than you did in the 2014. All right, once again, uh, Eldritch Invocations being moved down to the first level is, is cool. It makes sense. I mean, Eldritch Blast is something you get as a cantrip at level one. Um, I know not all of the invocations change Eldritch Blast, some change others. But for you to be able to do something like that at first level is great. And I'm looking forward to seeing which cantrips or which invocations we get at level one to see how well we can alter our warlocks. And I mean, to know that we're getting more invocations now than we previously had um, is nothing but a plus for me. Teen Warlock. That required us to revisit every single Eldritch Invocation, not only look at what it does and see if there are ways that we could improve it, but also we looked at are the invocations coming in at the right levels? Invocations for since they were introduced often have level prerequisites, and we wanted to make sure that the prerequisites were right. And so People who are familiar with the Warlock will find that a number of invocations had their level prerequisites lowered. So there were a number that required you to be quite high level that you can now take at a lower level. But then because this feature is now available at first level, many of the invocations that didn't have prerequisites before now do because uh, we A, did not want most of the invocations to suddenly be available to you immediately at first level. But we also wanted to make it so that you would not be overwhelmed as you considered your choices as a Warlock player. And so the level prerequisites really in a way help pace how many invocations uh, you have to consider as you go on your Warlocky journey through this class leveling up. And at first level, your your main choices when it comes to invocations are three 
that used to be a whole separate class feature. And that are, those are the packed boon, what previously were packed boon features, now are invocations. Yeah. And this is a big deal because not only uh, can, do you get things like Pact of the Blade or Pact of the Tome or Pact of the Chain, you can now get it at first level. Yeah. Okay, so that's kind of concerning. Uh, pack boons were great. They were something that gave each individual warlock some variability. Um, I'm hoping he's not saying that they're completely getting rid of pack boons. And they're just the old ones are being made into Eldritch Invocations. Um, I guess only time will tell. Uh, but also, I'm glad he mentioned some of them about level requirements for Eldritch Invocation. Something that I've noticed a lot of players forget about when it comes to making a Warlock or leveling up a Warlock is anytime you could change your invocation, you can change all of them. If you would get a new invocation, you can change the ones you already have. You can do it pretty much any time. So um, for, for him to mention that there's still going to be some level requirements, that tells me that there's still going to be adjustability throughout the gameplay, throughout the campaign. Uh, throughout the the life of the warlock, and that's fantastic that we're keeping that. I am slightly concerned about the pack boons, but if the old pack boons are being made into eldritch invocations, that's that's cool. Most of them were not great, but it gave each individual warlock their own little sense of individuality. But we'll see. But because we have turned them into invocations, you can now theoretically over time get all of them. Yeah. So they used to be mutually exclusive choices. Uh, you know, if you chose Pact of the Blade, you were never going to get Pact of the Tome. Now, if you want to build your Warlock to have both, you can. This invocation choice at first level is the choice you're now making That's when you cool. create your Warlock rather than choosing a subclass. Yeah. Subclass now, like for all, all of our classes, is at third level. That's been standardized for all of our classes. But as a warlock, you still have a very juicy choice at first level that shapes how your character is going to play. Uh, because you're, you're deciding, <laughs> am I leaning harder into the spellcasting side of my warlock? Am I instead going to start going down a sort of warlock warrior sort of path with Pact of the Blade? Or am I going to uh, focus more on having uh, spooky critters helping me uh, with uh, Pact of the Chain? That pact has been enhanced with more spooky critter options. Yes, it has. <laughs> and and uh, what we did, and this is something that people have often uh, wanted, and we were glad to provide it, and that is we provided more familiars that speak to the different types of patrons that warlocks can later choose. Yeah. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that, you know, it whatever patron you choose from this book or from a later book there is a there is a critter option here that is going to feel appropriate that's why now even a slad tadpole is an option i mean these horrific worms that burrow through things and people <laughs> but if if that is your bliss as a warlock player you can now have that in addition to the other options that were were present before yes that is my bliss also a skeleton familiar yes that's amazing uh because again we really are leaning into the spookiness yeah. of the warlock this is you know if you want to play a spellcaster who so i love that they're bringing in some new um familiars for the warlock that Familiars are just a huge thing as far as Warlocks go. Um, I've never really seen anyone play a Warlock and not use uh, Find Familiar, Summon Familiar, whatever. Um, <laughs> the Slod Tadpole's kind of a goofy choice to me, uh, personally. But the Skeleton uh, Familiar is really cool sounding. Um, got some great chances for, for role playing, which uh, is great. It's, it's a huge part of my table, personally. So I'm definitely looking forward to that. Um, I'm loving the sound of new familiars. It's it's going to be a fun time. Who has all sorts of, you know, spooky and occult magic. 
that is what this class is all about. So you, you also have a skeleton, but then on the other end of the aesthetic spectrum, you also could pick uh, you know, something that is more whimsical or helpful like a pseudo dragon or the sprite, which was available before, or a brand new monster, the Sphinx of Wonder. And the Sphinx of Wonder is a celestial that is here speaking to the fact that one of the patron options in this book is the celestial patron. Uh, and then also the Sphinx of Wonder is a part of a reimagined family of sphinxes that people will get to see in the new monster manual. And the Sphinx of Wonder is one of the stat blocks that is available. I'm so happy to see the Sphinx of Wonder. The Sphinx of Wonder, um, if I remember correctly, it was th from 3.5. Uh, somebody correct me if I'm wrong on that one. It's been a while. But it's, Sphinxes in general are cool monsters just to see. Um, I've never seen one be a familiar or somebody something that you can have uh, help you. Past the you know, the occasional like NPC, um, so for for there to be a Sphinx familiar for the Warlock, um, that's great. I'm not quite sure how it's going to work out since it's a Celestial, um, but maybe they'll touch on that. There is still 24 minutes left of this video. In the creature appendix, as are all of the creatures that the warlock can choose for this feature. So, I mean, in, in the full list, again, every every monster that's mentioned, it's in the player's handbook. Imp, pseudo dragon, quasit, skeleton, slod, tadpole, which I love, uh, sphinx of wonder, sprite, and even a venomous snake. Yeah, the venomous snake used to be an option in the find familiar spell itself, but now it is actually specifically a warlock option. Awesome. Uh, particularly because the venomous snake was actually mechanically better than all of the other <laughs> options in Find Familiar. Yeah. Uh, and so it has moved into the Warlock list. And this, again, like if you went back to the chain, you have abilities later that enhance. So you can use a bonus action to cause them to attack. They could like swim or fly. They get all these other abilities if you choose to continue to stack. That's why I like about Warlock so much is they're so modular. And that flexibility in building the character is true for each of these packed options that you choose at first level. Because if you choose Pact of the Blade, there are also later invocations that you can take that further enhance it, uh, and enhance it in ways that the 2014 uh, Warlock did not. Uh, you can get to the point where you, know, you are making extra attacks and healing yourself with your blade strikes uh, that is really satisfying and allows you uh, to really be powerful as a weapon using warlock. It used to be that you had to have a subclass that sort of really unlocked this. Yeah. Um, that is no longer the case. Now you, with the base class, uh, have this as a legitimate option. Pact of the Tome also has uh, later invocations that build on it. But then also Pact of the Tome speaks to the fact that spellcasting in general for the Warlock has been enhanced. So in addition to there being, uh, you know, the magical cunning feature that I mentioned before, we've also made more of the invocations work with more of the Warlock's spells than before. Yeah. So it used to be that most of the invocations that modified spells only pertained to Eldritch Blast. Yeah. And now, uh, and I, this is exciting for me as a person who enjoys playing Warlocks. Granted, I enjoy playing every single one of our classes. And uh, I really love that we've now made it so that if you want to modify other cantrips, you can now do that. Yeah. Uh, and Eldritch Blast is still fantastic. Yeah. It, you know, is still a Warlock. All right, that's fantastic that the Eldritch Invocations are, in fact, going to be usable to enhance other cantrips. Um, Eldritch Blast is still going to be the bread and butter of the Warlock class. It's just how it's always going to be. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, it's good to know, though, that we can enhance our other cantrips. Hopefully, there will be some that enhance some of the leveled spells as well, but who knows? 
So we'll have some form of variability. We don't have to just rely on Eldritch Blast anymore. And that is just so fantastic. They are so far with the Warlock doing everything right. Just about everything right. Block specific cantrip. You really cannot go wrong, but you now have more build options uh, when you come to this class. You could have Bray of Frost that also knocks people back. That's a great example of uh, the kind of fun combo that we have built in here. I mean, because just think about that. You can hurl someone back if you decide to use Repelling Blast with Ray of Frost instead of Eldritch Blast, hurl someone back and slow them. Yes. Which is essentially making your Ray of Frost slow them even more effectively. Yeah. Uh, because it's going to, if it, uh, assuming they were trying to get to you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, maybe now they'll just decide to run towards somebody else, but that's probably what the Warlock was going for. Yeah. <laughs> Among the new invocation options, we even have like Lessons of the First Ones, which is a brand new invocation that simply lets the Warlock take another origin feat. Yeah. Those feats that, you know, every character gets one now when they make their character at first level. Well, if you as a Warlock simply want to get more of those starting feats, that is one way you can use your invocation choices. So if you're looking for more like Maybe you want the skilled feat, the alert feat, luck. Tough, you want more hit points. No, again, more modular, more customization for like the, what kind of creepy warlock you want to play. And that invocation alone opens up so many modular build options because it gives you access to all of the origin feats. Yeah. And th that, that's why in many ways this class is the the character builder's paradise yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, because of how many different ways you can combine all of these options. It will be very hard to meet two warlocks that are exactly the same. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and that's something we were going... You know, I hope they're right on that. Um, a lot of the warlocks I've seen in, in the games that I've run, they are just been copy-paste of the, the one before it. Unfortunately, I don't think that there will be too much of a variability between Warlocks for too terribly long. Somebody will find the the build that does the most damage, and that's what people are going to play as. You know, it's saddening, but a lot of people just want to do more damage. They want to be the star of the combat, and I get it, but let's let's as a whole try and step away from that and just have fun, you know? Build your Warlock the way you want to in order to have fun. No, don't worry about combat, you know? Um, I hope they're right, though. I hope that they're all kind of, like, equal, so there will always be different Warlocks. But I've seen what players do. I've been playing the game for way too long at this point. I've, I've unfortunately seen the way powerful classes devolve, and... I just, you know, I just hope they're right. Going for, uh, we, you know, while while wanting to preserve the the special identity of of like Eldritch Blast and all of that being a part of this class, we also really wanted to open up more ways to build your warlock and play your warlock, and people are going to find that we did that not only in the base class itself but also in the invocation options, and then also in the subclass options. I mean, another big enhancement that I absolutely love is you can call upon your patron. Yes. Which seems so fundamental to being a warlock. Yeah, so we, we, we realized while, while revising the class that the class had no built-in way to just chit-chat yeah. with their patron, even though that is such a common shtick in campaigns to have warlocks, you know, wanting to basically, you know, call HQ and, yeah. <laughs> and find out what their patron is up to or to fight with them. Because so I don't have a problem with this personally. Um, it looks like they went, oh, you know, clerics can can call upon their whatever god or goddess they follow. That seems like a neat idea. Let's give it to the warlocks as well. And while there's not a huge problem with that, I'm 
struggling to figure out how they're going to incorporate it in such a way that it doesn't just feel like knockoff cleric, you know, knockoff channel divinity. Um, and I mean, I don't know about the rest of the DMs out there, but me personally, I would always incorporate conversations with, with a Warlock's patron uh, throughout the campaign just to give them a chance to roleplay, just to give them a chance to pick up a new side quest, you know, fun stuff like that. So that was never really an issue to me personally. I don't know about other DMs, other players. So I like the idea of it. I like the concept of it. I'm just struggling to think of how they're going to do this without it just kind of feeling like a cheap Channel Divinity knockoff. But once again, only time will tell. Because, of course, some warlocks don't like their patron. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's sort of a, a, a boss that they're <laughs> estranged uh, with or just a, a battery for their power that uh, they don't actually like. Uh, we also uh, have, just like in other classes, we've given warlocks now the epic boon at 19th level. Uh, and warlocks, of course, still have uh, their great mystic arcanum feature, which gives them yet more uh, flexibility in how they're built. Uh, and also their uh, class spell list has been expanded. And this is true of every class in the book. Every list has more spells on it. Uh, but I think this will be especially great for warlocks uh, because their class spell list was pretty short before. Now, it's still not... No. The Warlock's class spell list being increased is cool, especially if they're new spells, not old spells that other classes had that now the Warlock has. Um, but it wasn't really necessary. The, I feel like the main reason the Warlock spell list was so small is because they've got no spell slots. Their spell list is irrelevant to some extent because the maximum amount of spell slots they end up having it by level 20 i want to say is like nine pretty sure it's nine um unless they increase it with the 2024 player's handbook giving them more spells to choose from just feels like um kind of a tease like hey <laughs> look at all these spells you don't get to cast because you don't have the spell slots for them sucks to suck you know it, it just it feels like a kick in the pants, you know? Uh, I I like that they're getting new spells, but it feels unnecessary to some extent, unless they're also increasing the number of spell slots that the Warlock gets. So, here's hoping. Uh, at the length of, say, the Wizard, uh, yeah. or even the Sorcerer, uh, particularly because Warlocks don't just rely on their spells, they also rely on their eldritch invocations. And we also have to be careful whenever we put spells on the warlock spell list, how it interacts with pack magic. Because unlike other spellcasters, their spells are always basically leveling up automatically. Mm -hmm. So there are certain spells that we have to be very careful about uh, with warlocks. And, uh, but even, even with that carefulness being in the mix, uh, people are going to see that uh, their class list uh, uh, has some uh, fun additions to it. Perfect. The Archfey patron is super tempting. And if you like teleporting, holy cow. So tell me a little bit about <laughs> the Archfey patron warlock. We looked at the Archfey patron from 2014 and felt it needed a major enhancement. Yeah. Uh, people have often loved the theme of it, of forming a pact with, you know, a member of the Fey Court, and you know whether whether this is, uh, you know, a a person like, you know, the Prince of Air and Darkness or an Arch Hag. It has so much wonderful flavor, yeah. but we found that the gameplay of it was not living up to the flavor. Yeah. And we decided that because often our Fey-oriented player mechanics involve teleportation, we were going to go all in on that in the Archfey patron. And so what you have now is a subclass that is going to let you 
you know, vanish and reappear elsewhere frequently, but not just that. It also allows you to layer on extra effects each time you teleport using Misty Step. And this, by the way, is not just when you use Misty Step with your Steps of the Fae feature. The Steps of the Fae feature in the new subclass allows you to cast Misty Step a certain number of times per day without expending a spell slot. And then it also allows you to, again, put on these extra effects. But those extra effects can be put on whenever you cast Misty Step, yeah. not just when you're casting it for free. So also, if you decide to just keep casting it, yeah. even with your spell slots, you get to add on these extra effects. This is something that we expo explored previously in the Eladrin uh, of teleporting and having these extra effects, but the Arch Fae patron takes that notion and dials it up to 11. This includes uh, helpful effects like teleporting and gaining temporary hit points, but then it also includes things like taunting step where you impose disadvantage on someone's attack rolls unless they attack you. Now, and you as a warlike player might be wondering, why would I want to encourage someone to attack me? Yeah. Well, I'm glad you asked because, <laughs> because as you go deeper into this subclass, you'll see that you then start gaining abilities where you can then punish people for attacking you yeah. by dealing psychic damage to them. You can also make it so that you turn invisible. And so now suddenly they have disadvantage to attack everybody else, but also you. We love this shtick so much that in the level 14 feature, which is brand new, Bewitching Magic, we've made it so that uh, once you reach this level, whenever you cast an enchantment or illusion, an illusion spell, hey, you can also Misty Step. <laughs> and that Misty Step can have these extra effects. So this is going to be ridiculous in all the best ways. Like yeah. This, we really wanted... Uh, that fey flavor, which includes often a kind of trickster element. And you, you're going to see this here of you are, you're vanishing, you're reappearing, you're messing with the foe. Uh, monsters are going to hate this warlock. And this is the core identity of being a fey, you know, having a fey patron. Yes. Again, I, I look forward to people dying. This seems super fun and incredibly broken i know some of my players are going to try and use this and they're going to just break the absolute hell out of it and that's great um i think it brings on the air of of a fake creature um like he said and that's that's great the massive amount of teleporting is going to get tedious to track i'm sure uh especially with the bewitching magic um but I am looking forward to seeing this put into play. Um, I think this is going to be one of the most played subclasses for the Warlock just because of how fun the free Misty Steps can be. So I still don't think even with this subclass anyone's going to expend one of the few spell slots the Warlocks have on Misty Step. But I could be wrong. It depends on what all of the effects they could put in place are. I just... You know, I just really doubt that anybody's going to want to waste a, a spell slot for Misty Step instead of, you know, attacking. But, hey, we'll see. Diving in, people got to see a version of this in the Unearthed Arcana process, uh, and it is just a teleportation fantasia. Yeah, that leads us into, let's talk about this Celestial Patron. So the Celestial Patron originally appeared in Xanathar's Guide to Everything. It's now graduated to the Player's Handbook, and in the process, we have enhanced it in a number of ways. This subclass, along with the others, gets to benefit from the expanded spell list and spell chapter of this book. And I'm bringing that up now when we're with the Celestial Patron, because one of the spells we were able to add to their, their list of spells is Summon Celestial, one nice. of the new Summon spells. And you're going to see that 
in a number of our classes that have either you know, patron lists like this, or the oath list and the paladin, or the domain lists and the, and the cleric, and so on and so forth, that these subclasses really have benefited from the expanded spell chapter in this book. Also, something we didn't talk about with the Archfey patron, which I'll, I'll mention here, all warlock subclasses in the book have a major enhancement when it comes to that list of spells they get. Because in 2014, that expanded spell list that each patron provided simply gave you an expanded list that you could choose from when choosing the spells that your warlock knew. The major difference now is you automatically have all of these spells always prepared, and they do not count against the spells that you prepare with your pack magic feature. That's amazing. That, that means every warlock that uses these subclasses is going to just suddenly have a much fuller kit uh, when it comes to the spells that are available to them. Once again, that's, that's great. It's cool that depending on which subclass you get, you're going to get a set of spells added that are automatically prepared at all times. But <laughs> once again, if, if we don't have the spell slots to utilize these spells properly, more prepared spells is kind of irrelevant. Um, if you have nine spell slots and picking this subclass is going to give you nine spells and you know automatically prepared at all times not counting all the other ones then it's like cool but i'm not gonna use any of those i'm gonna use the the nine spells that i picked that i personally picked as a reason i picked them so it's like i don't know maybe they're gonna be really useful and people are gonna use the hell out of them but it's it's disheartening to to hear that they think that the problem was that the warlocks didn't have enough spells now they didn't have enough spells to choose from but that wasn't the biggest problem the biggest problem was they couldn't cast enough spells they didn't have the spell slots to cast enough spells um so we'll see and it's unfortunate how often i have to say that but for the most part, they're doing everything right with the Warlock. They've done a couple things that I disagree with personally, uh, and you guys might disagree with me on that one, but for the most part, I don't have a whole lot of complaints. So let's keep going. To cast with Pack Magic. Yeah. Uh, so that is a big deal, particularly important for the Celestial Patron Warlock, because it's these spells that really help bring the celestial flavor to life. It's how you get spells like Guiding Bolt, Cure Wounds, Aid. It helps you really fulfill that fantasy of being the helpful warlock. Uh, and that, that in many ways is the identity of the celestial patron warlock. Uh, you know, not, not all warlocks are, are necessarily <laughs> selfish with their power. But you still could be. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you, you absolutely could be. Could the most be. evil celestial warlock. You'd be like a hired hitman <laughs> by the gods. <laughs> um, and people will find that there are a number of adjustments within this subclass, uh, you know, that now f tying into some of the material in the base class. Uh, you know, so Celestial Resilience, for instance, now gets to play off your Magical Cunning feature in the base class. All really fabulous, uh, including at level 14 in Searing Vengeance, this feature now applying to you or an ally. Perfect. The Fiend has always been an extremely popular... So, the Celestial Patron sounds neat interesting um <laughs> i'm gonna be honest with you i don't think any of my players are going to use it um mostly because if you're gonna pick a, a class and a subclass that lets you heal why would you not just pick a healer um but also the the warlock is having enough trouble you know putting out damage as it is 
So why would you pick a class that is going to forego some of the damaging spells for cure wounds or aid, you know, stuff like that? I love the idea of it. I love the premise of it. I love the all the possible RP ideas and side quest ideas that come from them talking about a Celestial Patron uh, subclass. Unfortunately, I think this is going to be the least played one out of all the subclasses for it. Um, and that's saddening, but there's going to be one. There's bound to be one that was played less than the rest. And Celestial, I'm fairly certain, is going to be it. I, it feels like a big swing and a miss to me. Um, let me know what if you disagree with that statement, though, I'd love to have a dialogue in the comment section. Or an iconic uh, warlock subclass. A and really strong out of the gate. The fiend of the four subclasses has the most of its sort of 2014 pieces still present. Right. But those pieces have all been enhanced. The spell list uh, has been revisited. You can use some of your features more often than you could before, like Dark One's own luck. Hurl Through Hell is still terrifying, but also has sort of clearer functionality uh, than it had before. You also, with the fiendish resilience that you get here, magical weapons no longer bypass your resistance. That's fantastic. Yeah. So it's this of the four subclasses is the most like what it was before but even so you're gonna find just just a bit better uh, oddly tanky in uh Baldur's gate 3 really because that constantly killing killing of a uh, creature and getting temporary hit points balancing around like that uh just kept you alive on the battlefield much longer than i anticipated that tankiness in Baldur's gate 3 is also here in spades because probably the biggest enhancement for the fiend patron is in dark one's blessing yeah uh because now you gain its benefit whether you're the one who drops the foe or someone else does within a certain distance of you so you are going to be farming those temporary hit points much more easily than you ever could before. Great old ones. This one is for all intents and purposes. All right, so that is great. Um, I love that they have a subclass that they left mostly the same, and they just tweaked it just a bit to, one, match the rules for, for 2024, for 1D&D, for D&D 6th edition, whatever you're calling it. Um, Personally, to me, it's 6th edition, but that's neither here nor there. Um, I love they've made it tankier. It's got some more survivability, which other casting classes don't necessarily have. Um, I love that they don't have to be the one to, to do the final blow, the finishing blow, to get those temporary hit points. They just have to be close to whoever does. Uh, by the sounds of it, they'll also get temporary hit points if one of their allies goes down, if they're within range. I... Don't know, like, I don't have the, the player's handbook in front of me. I'm not one of the 11 people. Um, but judging by what they just said, that's what it sounded like. And that'd be really cool because that means if one of your allies go, d goes down, that means that you're, you know, in a bind. You're having issues with this fight. Now you're having a little bit less issue with this fight because you got some temporary hit points. So you could potentially save your players' uh, lives with that. And... You know, that's great. This is a new subclass. We really rebuilt the subclass from the ground up, just like the Archfey patron, because we felt that the great old one patron in 2014 oozed with flavor. And I, and I, and I very purposefully... <laughs> Literally. Cho yes, choose the word oozed <laughs> with with this, this subclass that is all about entities like Cthulhu. Yeah. Uh, but we felt that just as the Archfey patron didn't really deliver the goods well enough mechanically, we felt the same here. Those two subclasses really needed an overhaul so that they felt like peers to the Celestial and Fiend patron warlocks. Mm -hmm. Celestial and Fiend patron warlocks were on really solid ground mechanically. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but these two, they needed, they needed some love. 
And uh, in this case, oh my gosh, did we pour on the ooze uh, <laughs> and, and, and the psionic power. Yeah. Uh, because now you're going to be able to much more easily have that fantasy of using uh, psychic power to harm people, to whisper into other people's minds, uh, to summon an aberration, because again, one of the, the benefits of having the new summoning spells in this book is that we could now build the summon aberration spell directly into this subclass, uh, because the create through all feature now relies on you summoning up this strange creature from beyond the stars, uh, which the new version of Summon Aberration, one of the options uh, includes summoning a mind flayer. Yeah. <laughs> so the, 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 the friend you summon might be a mind flayer that appears and is helping you. Now, not a mind flayer from the monster manual. Yes, it but is the, a, a version. It is a, a mind flayer option within the summon aberration spell. And this is a great spell list for them, by the way. I mean, because that's a big change for these, these earlier ones. But bringing Detect Thoughts, Dissonant Whispers, Phantasmal Force, Tasha's Hideous Laughter, Clairvoyance, Hunger of Hadar, Confusion, Summon Aberration, Modify Memory, and Telekinesis. And when you do damage, you can turn things into psychic damage. Yes, because that, that connects to the fact that three of the features in this subclass are entirely new. Now, Create Thrall is functionally also entirely new, but it's using the old name. Yeah. But Psychic Spells, Clairvoyant Combatant, and Eldritch Hex are all entirely new features in this subclass. And they are allowing you to, first off, uh, when you cast enchantment or illusion spells, you can do so without verbal or somatic components because we wanted you to be able to feel like that psionic magic user where it's just your mind is doing it. Yeah. And they're, they're not, no one is necessarily seeing you do anything while you use your spooky magic. Uh, but as you mentioned, the Psychic Spells feature also lets you, when you deal damage with a Warlock spell, change it to Psychic. Yeah. Uh, so you can have, again, this sort of full psionic fantasy of whatever spell you're casting uh, that's dealing damage, it can be Psychic damage. And you can flavor that as, this is all in your head. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, well, particularly because they never saw you, they never <laughs> saw you <laughs> exactly. casting a spell. Yeah. Um, so also then with Clairvoyant Combatant, this new feature ties in with the subclass's Awakened Mind feature where you can, with Awakened Mind, create a connection yeah. between your mind and someone else's. Well, then with Clairvoyant Combatant, you can make that connection go bad. This is all about really zeroing in on a target and just heightening how much damage you're doing to that one target. This is actually a nod to uh, how psionics worked back in first edition D&D, where you could have these psionic battles going on in people's minds yeah. and nothing visible is even happening. You know, if someone were w watching, like, uh, it looks like those people are like flinching in pain, but from what? Yeah. And this subclass just brings that to the table. The Elder Hex is significantly more powerful as well. Yes, the enhanced version of Hex that you have is again all about heightening the suffering for this one target because it gives them disadvantage on saving throws. And so that is going against a, a certain ability. Uh, so you can, let's say if you're going to be casting spells that force wisdom saving throws, you can use this spell, uh, your hex, to give them disadvantage on wisdom saving throws, which again can create the sort of snowball effect uh, with your your harmful magic against There's them. a lot of synergy with all of these subclasses. I mean, all everything in the New Player's Handbook is very intentional. As a giant fan of Warlocks, it's very difficult to make a choice. So, all of that sounds really fun. Um, summoning Aberration, Increasing the list for that spell is great. Um, I like the idea of Mind Flayers being summonable. Um, it's going to be so fun. 
Uh, and then being able to change all the this Warlock spell damage to Psychic is great, especially since most things don't have a resistance Psychic. Most things that have resistances, Psychic resistance is going to be the least seen resistance. So it's a great way to get around certain things. Um, this is going to be great. The Warlock really got a, the huge buff that it needed uh, to still be able to stand up and contend with the other spellcasters. Not that it was like lagging too far behind, um, but it was definitely behind on damage in certain ways, in certain aspects. So to see that it got a buff like this was, it's fantastic. This is exactly what I was hoping for. This is almost exactly what I was hoping for. They didn't spell, say anything about the spell slot lists, the spell slot numbers, which is tells me that there's probably going to be the same number of spell slots such as what i expected unfortunately but it's been working for so long so i guess why rock the boat on that one right uh, the rest of this video is just them talking about how excited they are about the warlock class which i've just done myself and i don't know about you but their voices are kind of putting me to sleep so <laughs> Um, but that was the Warlock. That's the new Warlock that's coming out in the 2024 Player's Handbook, which is coming out in September 13th? 17th? Sometime in the middle of September. That's all I can really remember. I'm bad with dates sometimes. Um, but if you learned anything, uh, be sure to hit the uh, subscribe button for me if you'd be so kind. Um, if you liked the, the way I went about this one, go ahead and let me know in the comments. If you want me to go back to my old school uh, classroom style teaching, go ahead and let me know that in the comments. If you disagree with anything I've said in this, go ahead and once again, let me know in the comments and let's start a dialogue and let's have a, let's have a conversation. Maybe I can change your mind. Maybe you can change my mind. I'm always open to everybody's uh, opinions. So thank you for watching.